It's great to be here. Um, you are a class act. You really have stuff together. Um, and uh, I was just sitting musing about Ohio um, and, and the phenomenon of when you're in the middle of something not um, being fully cognizant or aware of where you are in space and time sometimes or really appreciate what's going on. So I don't know if you know it, but Ohio is kind of where it's at these days. <laughs> Um, we are, um, at a national level, really um, in awe and admiration of um, the consistent progress you make toward a good vision, the clarity of your vision, um, the astuteness of your politics, the level of your partnership. Um, I don't think there are many places where we see um, this kind of partnership between local government and state government where those arrangements exist um, and families and um, everything that comes out. This employment first stuff is terrific. Um, so you are watched. Um, the other thing you don't have and you are taking advantage of is you are not one of those states that's mired right now in let's shut up everything down or let's put everything into managed care. Um, in some of those states where the governor's office has decided without much deliberation with many people to just move right ahead into managed care, everybody's in a reactive mode and unable to shape it. And um, there's so much of that that other states are dealing with that's not here, and you fill that space with great leadership and great planning. So um, it's just great to be here. It's always good to be here. Um, let me, um, is it working? Okay. Um, I, I basically have two topics, and some of, if you've ever heard me speak before, I have a theme, um, a mission, you might say, um, is to help states, mostly policymakers, see the future and prepare for it. So some of this you'll hear, before, you've heard before, but it's, um, I hope my message is getting a little sharper. And then I am going to talk about the new CMS regs. Okay, so, oh, this looks funny when it's out on a long screen. Does it look okay? Yeah, it looks better there. Um, so I always use this. There's some new pictures in it, um, but it's when we use all our Medicaid talk and our language and our bureaucratic talk and political talk and all the words we use, it's often hard to remember exactly, you know, what's the vision here? And the vision, as we used to say in Pennsylvania, is just an everyday life. Just, or what's becoming popular is a good life, just a good life. Um, and for some people, hard to achieve. Um, that kind of autonomy and um, you know, what, what, what is it we all want in our lives? Love, happiness, that we are somebody, that people recognize us, that we're valued, that we get a chance for our talents to show, we all want to be somebody. Um, and so that's all we're talking about here. There it is, happy, safe, friends, school, job. Um, that we can't talk about a good life also with talking about that concept of autonomy or some people say self-direction or self-determination, but that ability for people to make a decision about the little things in their life and the big things in their life. What I eat for breakfast or whether I eat breakfast and where I live, these are equally important decisions for people to feel like they have control over their own person. And um, the absence of control over your own person is really a um, catalyst for mental health problems. Um, and if we don't think so, just sort of imagine when you get up in the morning not having control over your rhythm and routine that day and sort of where your head would be by the end of the day. So that's a very important aspect of this. And contributing, it's not just employment, it's not just a job. It's making a difference. It's, it's contributing, being part of something bigger than ourselves and dreams. Okay, so I've been talking about demographics a lot. And I've been thinking it's a lot like climate change. It's inconvenient to think about, as Al Gore said. Um, and you can deny that the demographics are with us. But, you know, like with climate change, when the ocean comes up, you're going to move, whether you deny climate change or not. The demographics are coming, 
And I am astounded at how little dialogue there is about this nationally and the total absence of it in Washington, D.C. While I'm going to talk about other nations in the world facing this head on. So, the baby boom generation. Um, I can update my slides these days because more people, more think tanks are starting to write about this, right? The rapid rise in the elderly, this is the baby boomers. Um, and the fact that of the baby boomers, of those people, 10,000 every day enrolling in Medicare and Social Security, 70% of them will need at least three years of long-term care. Now, what's significant about that? Well, the baby boomers didn't save any money. They're, um, more than half of them have less than $10,000 worth of assets. And so the baby boomers that didn't save any money that are in that 70% are going to spend down in about 30 days when they need long-term support services. So you're looking at a population that's going to increase the demand on Medicaid pretty significantly. And I'm sure some of you, like me, are watching this in your own family. Very comfortable middle class aunt and uncle, children grown, um, nice retirement from the job, uh, husband gets serious Alzheimer's, they make a go of it for about a year and a half at home, he goes to the hospital in a crisis, he goes into the nursing home, he's there and he's spending down pretty fast. At $80,000 a year you can spend down your assets pretty quickly. And so I'm watching a family who never th didn't know the words Medicaid. Now going to a lawyer to talk about how to spend. And that's really going to be the theme. Um, the other phenomenon simultaneously is, um, is that um, because the population that's older is bigger than the population that's younger, unlike places, by the way, like Pakistan and Iran, where 50 and 60 percent of the population is under 30. Right? These, are, these are countries with huge youth populations. And their problem is they don't have work for them. And they get angry, and then they use Twitter, and then they revolt. I mean, that's their problem. Our problem is the reverse. We've got a small, young, a small population of young people and a large population of large people. Why is that a problem? Because this is a pay-as-you-go system in the United States, Social Security and, and, and Medicare. And so you've got, in 1960, five workers for every person on Social Security in 2040 two people for every person on Social Security and collecting Medicare. And Medicare is by far the bigger problem than Social Security is. Um, so remember back when Social Security was passed, it was for widows and children because the life expectancy was something like 45 or 50. Um, and so no, never designed to support people who are now living until 85, 90, and 100. Um, so what this means is, I don't know, that little blue arrow doesn't belong there. That little blue arrow belongs on 2014. Um, sorry about that. Sometimes things bounce around when you email them. Um, so not only will the baby boomers drain resources out of the public coffers, they will drain workers out of the public coffers. And we have now... If we didn't have such a severe recession and unemployment rate, we'd be in really bad shape providing care. But what's really buffering it right now is we still have a high unemployment rate. Um, but when that gets fixed, and it will, I hear Congress is passing an infrastructure bill so on, on water projects for $3 billion or $30 billion or something. So when Congress decides that we're going to start rebuilding the country's infrastructure, we're going to see a lot of things turn around. And, um, we're, and we're going to see competition for labor increase. And so we have here, even the Wall Street Journal noticed this this year. That, and the quote is, a labor shortage is worsening in one of the nation's fastest growing occupations, taking care of the elderly and disabled just as the baby boomers head into old age. And that chart on the bottom, you've, if you've ever heard me speak, you've seen that chart. It's the, the flat line, our working age women. 25 to 25 to 44. The pink line are old people, the baby boomers, and you can see as the decades go, the gap between who needs care and who is available to provide care continues and continues to increase. 
Japan's solution, by the way, to this is interesting. Um, Japan has the oldest population in the world. Um, and sorry, I don't have the percentage off the top of my head, but it's really distorted. And um, they don't believe in immigration. They don't allow immigration in Japan. So they're investing heavily into robotics to provide care for the elderly. You know those little robotic dogs they now put in nursing homes? Well, they're looking at robotics. It's a pretty sobering thought. Um, and it's not that everybody's in Medicaid and everybody's going to be working in home and community-based services, but even now, baby boomers are taking workers out of the workforce. It's the, mom who, it's the woman who quits her job to stay home with her mother. It's, it's, or, or baby boomers with wealth who will hire people to take care of them with private money. But however it happens, they're going to be drawing, we, I can they, we are going to be drawing people out of the workforce. I am being very good to my nieces, by the way. <laughs> it's my social security. Um, <laughs> very good to my nieces. <laughs> um, pressures on funding. I've been using this slide for at least six years, and the Center for Budget and Policy, um, which is a kind of a liberal think tank, not a conservative think tank, um, never changes this. And this shows um, at the far right of this box uh, the, the black line is federal revenues, and um, why doesn't it increase? Why does it look flat? Well, because it's been pretty flat. Our national growth rate, you know, when the recession hit in 2009, what, every, what all the predictors said is to recover from the um, depression, recession, um, we'd have to grow, states would have to grow 8% a year for 10 years to recover their base. And we're growing at one and a half, two and a half percent a year. So federal revenues are pretty flat. And we're in um, a still very, very strong uh, paradigm of don't collect taxes, don't tax anybody. So the revenues are gonna stay pretty flat. Um, and what you can see is that by year 2050, when we reach our peak, um, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security eat up all federal revenues if nothing changes in the design of the program. And everything above that line includes the Pentagon. Think about that. Includes the Pentagon, education, transportation, housing, everything. And so clearly this is not sustainable. And um, and it's astonishing that we have nothing going on on the Hill. We have no White House conferences about this. We are in denial because this is an inconvenient truth, to coin Al Gore, and because how are you going to fix this? You won't be able to beat the other opponent in your election over the head for trying to tinker with Medicare. But that's exactly what they have to do. And so what do I think will happen personally? Um, it will happen cataclysmically and in the dark of night without much participation because the day of reckoning will come and the longer we delay it, the worse it will be. Uh, so that's our reality. Our reality is money's not going to grow, labor's a problem, we still got waiting lists, and you as leaders in the disability system still have to make it work, and yet we have to think about people on the waiting list and people who don't have anything. So, clearly the conclusion that I've been talking about for a long time is don't invest, don't put all your eggs in the basket that requires 24-hour heavy staff arrangements because they're not going to be there. And so the more we can think about how it is we get people a good life for as little expense as possible, those are the strategies. That's where our heads have to be now. Um, by the way, um, uh, the president was ready to tackle this. Um, there was a grand bargain offered in... Um, uh, 2011, I think, where the president put on the table pretty significant Medicaid cuts, enough to, t 
take the breath away from his supporters um, and put it on the table as a grand bargain. I think a lot of people were relieved the Republicans didn't take him up on it. Um, but periodically, you will hear um, little proposals here and there that don't get talked about. So I do, I do think people know there's just no political will and no climate to uh, deal with this. Okay, so the reality is families are the backbone in the nation's long-term care system. And let me go back in my slides, because this is what I think. If you're in Congress, oh, sorry about that. If you're in Congress and, and you think, oh, if I don't do anything about this, what will happen? What if we get to 2040 and the money's really bad and we can't run out of, we run out of everything and what will, well, families will always be there, right? I don't have to worry. Fam f families are the default. And that's my picture of families as the default in a future where people haven't planned. So we can do something about this. So families are the backbone of long-term care in this country. 39% of all adults care for a loved one who is sick or disabled going up every year. And it's not just women. My slide always shows women. It's not just women. Men are almost as likely to be caregivers as women. Um, almost half of family caregivers perform complex medical... So this is not just um, be in the house with somebody or make meals for somebody. Caregivers are doing complex medical supports, not just lightweight stuff. Um, here's another slide. 85% of older family care recipients receive care from their spouses or children. So when you're looking at the elderly, a -A 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 part AARP will tell you this, 85% of the caregiving is, is done by family caregivers. Um, it is uh, arrogant for Medicaid or the public system to talk about the long-term care system that we fund and operate. We're marginal. Families operate long-term care systems in this country. Families are the long-term care system. And if there's anything you take away from me talking, it's that. Families are, are doing this. In DD, almost 90% of people with DD are living with their families. We serve about a million of the four million, and of the million we serve, 60% live with their families while we're serving them. Families are doing it. This other stuff that we invest so much time and energy and attention to is not, it's the bulk of the money, but not the bulk of the people. So the question is, you've seen this before, um, not whether people who are aging and disabled, and I speak about that whole sector of people, will be living with relying on their family support. They already are. But it's a question of whether their families will struggle alone or they'll have a great life because the supports are there for them and they're part of their community. That's the challenge for us, is to think about not how we're going to care for people, not how we're going to hire people and provide long-term care, but how it is we're going to partner and support families to make it possible for them to do it and have a good life. And that's a different mission for us because in DD, our history is take people away from their families or their families drop them off, right? I mean, what's, what's in our DNA is 50 years of institutions where the family drops them off the door, we take them, or the family drops them off at the group home door. And so, you know, in group homes, do families get to see the room? Do they come over for dinner? Likely not. They're really kept at bay. And so for us to think about we're entering their world is a different paradigm. How are governments responding? So um, you, you ought to Google this and download it and read it. It's pretty good. Um, easing Britain's generation st strain. Um, in it, um, they talk about three big general points. One is establishing a different starting point for social care services by asking, what do people need to have a good life? person-centered planning, right? It's this. It's asking, what kind of job would you like? Now, let, let me talk a little bit about that first bullet. 
Anybody here been reading about the concept of behavioral economics? Is that, um, so behavioral economics is you know, MIT, Harvard, Chicago University, a bunch of researchers. But one of them is named, a guy named Cass Sunstein. And for the first, year, first term of the administration, he was in the White House in charge of um, an office on, I think, regulatory reform or something. Wrote a book called Nudge, N-U-D-G-E. I highly recommend it. It's about behavioral economics. And behavioral economics recognizes that what drives economics is not rational thinking. It's emotion. I went for a walk last night over that nice small thinking I'm doing a power walk, and um, there was a sale. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm going home poorer than I came. And so was that rational thinking, planning? Mm -mm -mm, it wasn't. Um, you know the phenomenon of behavioral economics and how people are using it through a couple of mechanisms. One is it, when and companies had retirement plans. They used to ask people, do you want to sign up for the retirement plan? Discovering that a vast majority of young people say no, they changed the question. The question is, you are signed up for the retirement plan. Do you want to opt out? The vast majority do not. That's using behavioral economics to structure an interaction so that people make good decisions for themselves Good decisions for society and good decisions for the nation. That's a win, win, win. Another is donor options um, for uh, organs. How you ask the question will determine whether people donate or don't donate. Harvard Business Review, if you, if you log on to their thing and, and their daily download, um, you don't have to buy that very expensive magazine. Um, but you can get their daily download. They have this daily stat thing, and it's almost always behavioral economics. People who, oh, what was the well, one this week was, um, people are more likely to make purchases when they're in a room that's 72 to 74 degrees. When people are in rooms that are below 70, they're less likely to buy something online, right? So, or in a store. So it's understanding what motivates people. And what Sunstein said is that when you, you have to structure, um, people are, are um, skeptical about this, and there's a whole um, anti-behavioral economics movement from people who say this is you know, mind control and the government interfering with people's thinking. Cass Sunstein makes the point that there's no such thing as neutral decision making. There's no such thing as somebody having all the information they need to make a good decision. Pensions are a great example. Another example of pension reform is, in the old days, you used to sign up for your pension and um, pick any stocks or any investments you want, and they discovered people make really bad choices. And so now, most pension programs package and give you package options. Like in my organization, you can pick a package that will remix by your age, as you age. So because most of us, are, our lives are busy. That's not the business we're in. I won't know enough to keep remixing my risk base as I age. It does it for me. And so I think it has enormous applicability to our business. And here's where I think in many, many places, oh, I'm sorry, what, what Sunstein says is so that the architecture of choices, you design a, a decision-making process that will lead people to likely make decisions good for them and everybody. So here's what I think about, and one of my missions in Washington, D.C. to get the feds to understand, is that assessment, doing an assessment on an individual who's coming into the system is not an assessment. It's an architecture of choice. How you conduct that assessment, what questions you ask, will shape how that person thinks about them, and it will shape what they want. So somebody comes in for an assessment, and you say, what are all the things wrong with you, and what services do you need? We've immediately created the architecture of you are a service recipient, and you need specialized services funded by the government. But if somebody walks in the door, as they do in Arizona, and the support coordinator says, tell me what your day's like. Tell me what you want for the future. What would help you get there? 
Are there any barriers? Blah, 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 blah. Let's look at the community. And eventually they get to services. But it's a very different discussion. And so we are inadvertently in this country with the intense pressure of the federal CMS agency going down a path of making consumers out of people by doing assessments for Medicaid. Now, we still have to do them, because it's the law, I guess. How we do them matters. Britain has a department of behavioral economics that is studying many domains of society and how to structure their interface with people. Um, here, here's an example. Remember Scared Straight? The um, take the kids into prison to see these nasty prisoners who tell them they have a horrible life. You know what the results was on the research of Scared Straight? Those kids that went through that were more likely to commit crimes. Good public policy, right? Not studied before it was done. Everybody, well, it was a good idea. Let's go out and do this. Later researchers, that's why you don't hear about those programs anymore. And so what Britain is doing is they're studying approaches up front, how to get people to pay their uh, uh, income tax on time, how to get people to pay tolls, all kinds of domains. And here's one. Start asking people what do they need to have a good life. Acknowledge family and mutual supports as the front line of care, not services. Okay, this is the nation of Britain can say this. Um, and encouraging new providers by creating opportunities to play a part in the delivery care. They're very big into loosening up and local control. So they have four proposed, four concepts. One is create networks to help older people stay active and healthy and help busy families balance work and care and reduce pressures on, on their, their state agency. They are assertively talking about building networks to support people and their caregivers, and their caregivers. Care coordinators providing a single local point of contact. Um, do you have ADRCs in Ohio? Adult? So um, we just achieved incredible success with the administration community living. We got them to abandon their uh, choice counseling approach which we helped them see was making consumers out of people. And they have completely revamped the training of the ADRCs to person-centered counseling, using Michael Small to help design it to get people on a different path. Option of a shared budget, familiar, and stronger employee rights for those caring for people who need more than 20 hours of care. So these are their four proposals. But my point is, this nation is thinking about the impact of demographics. German um, and aging is the British spe spelling of aging. Um, they're increasing their retirement age, offering subsidies to parents to stay home with infant children, um, increasing their social security contributions, two big structural things I think we probably should look forward to here. Targeting skilled immigrants. They're already targeting immigration to bring in people who can help. And subsidizing, de I love this, this is so German. Subsidizing developers who make better homes for the elderly and forcing them to build user-friendly homes for the aged. One of the other countries is creating intergenerational housing developments to deliberately, um, uh, here's an interesting one. The Dutch king, I didn't know they had one, announced the birth of the participatory society to devolve more power to local areas, facilitate mutual support. It's the next point that was really interesting. Their research discovered that there are plenty of people prepared to help a neighbor, um, but they won't do it until they're asked. That's me, by the way. I'm really, I'll help anybody, but I'm so busy, I, I don't get around to it. But if the next door neighbor knocked on my door or said, you know, every week, of course I would. They also learned that people are even less likely to ask to, for support. So the Dutch are trying to figure out strategies to make both those things easier to do. Offer help and ask for help. Um, policy should focus on making it easier for people to both offer and ask. Facilitating mutual aid is to be an aim of policy. It needs to be about connecting people who live close to each other and who have a reciprocal need rather than efforts to increase community cohesion. 
and Australia, um, looking at what they call lax or local coordinators. Um, they're looking at pushing things out to the neighborhood level, um, linking people to existing community groups and volunteerism. Um, and you know, at the bottom point is it, and it saves money. Okay, so we're not doing that in the United States. And we're, I don't, uh, 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 maybe New Hampshire is focusing on this. New Hampshire has a very aggressive campaign to bring young people into their state. They're so worried about how old their population is. But your counties, you're like little states, little countries. And it is, you're bigger than some states. Some of you are bigger than some states. Um, you can think about this at a community systems level. You can think high-level design. You can bring people together to maybe, maybe partnering with the aging system in your county, maybe not, maybe with the ADRCs, but you can start a dialogue. This has got me thinking about my little hometown, Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania. It's a little 2000. This has got me thinking about how we make our county and our town friendly for people who need support. Okay. Um, so you've seen this slide before. This is a no-brainer. This is why people are looking, frankly, and I say this with, a, with respect in Ohio, getting out of the ICFMR business. Okay. We have a lot of states that are out of the public ICFMR business entirely, about 12, 13 states, and most of them down to 100 beds. So Georgia's, Oklahoma's down to 59. Georgia's down to 100. And 50 or something, it's, they're re really, really dropping and p pulling that money out into the community. But we've got privates. There are a bunch of states, Ohio's one, Pennsylvania's one, Illinois's one, maybe Minnesota, that have a heavy investment in private ICFMRs. Um, I'm, I used to run them. I was a director of an ICFMR campus-based facility for a number of years. Um, I know why people like them. I know why people run them. But um, it, we need to move on. Um, we need to allow money to follow people. The, one of the biggest problems in ICFMR, other than the model, is that the money is, is under the control of a provider. And if you need something, you have to take what that provider has to offer. And when people are in the Medicaid waiver, the money's theirs. If they leave a program, they take it with them. And it's flexible and, um, and easier to work with. And um, I know that you've had strategies. You've worked together in this day on strategies to incentivize, to make it possible for providers to, to be held harmless as much as possible as they transition out. Um, it is possible. You're demonstrating as possible. People in, across the uh, border, um, at one point, Pennsylvania had a number of large private providers who transitioned out. They've kind of... They stopped doing that. Um, but it, it's sort of an, an, an inevitable development. Um, and it doesn't mean people need to lose business or they need to lose resources, but um, it's reconfiguring how we spend the money, as we say. Um, so this is simply a, a path that shows, um, based on research that Lakin did a while back, um, it costs more in buildings. I mean, that's what that says. The ICF more tends to cost more than the group home, tends to cost, cost more than what I call shared living, tend to cost more than supporting people with their family. Those numbers might not be your numbers, but I bet you any money the ratios hold up in, in Ohio. And so... Um, so this, if you're a budget person and you're trying to stretch money, obviously you're going to look at supporting families. The trick is to support them early enough. This is a glide path. I've used this before. Nudging the system towards sustainability. Down toward people living with their families, having a job, living in the community, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what, what are we doing in this country in the DD system? What are we doing? What are states paying attention to? Um, well, one is, can everybody live with their family forever? Some. Depends on how we define family. Um, we're seeing an interesting phenomenon with siblings who are empty nesters and say, if you can keep the support going you did when he was living with my mom and dad, I can do it. Um, so... Uh, highly individualizing this, um, living with siblings, living with other relatives, living with friends, living with a partner, um, supported living, those arrangements that are more like adoption than foster care, where you match people up and support them for long term. Um, all strategies based on a relationship 
and the relationship um, replaces 24-hour paid supports. These arrangements still cost money, but they don't cost $150,000 a year. And the stronger the relationship and the more embedded in the relationship, the lower the cost is. The more um, individualized and the more control the relationship manager has, the less costly it is. And so, but the, but the thing with this is you can only do this through person-centered planning. You, can't, you, you can throw up 10 ICFMRs or six group homes or seven sheltered workshops and people will come. You can't throw these up. These are built, every single person. But the interesting thing is, once you get the framework in place and the support structures in place, like shared living, once you have a couple of agencies who know how to do this, other agencies learn how to do this, and pretty soon families learn how to do this. Now, um, what's, what is a booster to this is the recent Department of Labor guidance on shared living. When the Department of Labor rule on companion, you all know the Department of Labor rule on companionship, right? You have to pay overtime and for travel time, and it's been a devastating blow to the attendant care um, system for people with physical disabilities. Um, but we immediately saw it as a threat to shared living, because if you had to start paying sh people who shared living arrangements, uh, by the hour, it would quickly become unaffordable. So we went, shall we say, berserk on the Department of Labor. Um, we had them all in in a closed door session with our members who politely beat them up. And um, what came out of that was a wonderful collaboration with the Department of Labor and guidance on shared living that said the Federal, Federal Labor Standards Act doesn't apply. Went to something that, let, let, for shortcut language, let me say foster care. When it's somebody who takes into their home someone to provide care, I always say to have a relationship with, um, they are not covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, assuming you do that under a contract relationship. So we're working with Anchor and Nashua to, on a guidebook for shared living and DOL um, with some models of contracts and guides for how you structure that contract to make sure you don't tip into the behavior of being an employer. Um, but most shared living is by contract anyway. The other boost to this is the IRS came out with a ruling that said, and you don't have to pay income tax. So in these arrangements, the family, person, widows, college student, whoever's hosting, doesn't have to pay income tax, and neither does anybody have to pay FICA on top of that. So there's a nice savings to our system out of that. Um, and so this is, you know, we have some boosting legislation here that makes this possible. So that's one thing people are looking at. Um, and this is delicate, sensitive, individualized, must be done with um, uh, attention to detail and relationships, but I think a big solution. My, husband, my son's been in shared living now for probably for nine years, and um, it was the solution for a guy who walked out of three group homes. Um, the other thing is employment, and you're really deep in this, and I don't think I have a slide, I don't have a slide for this, but my cost slide on employment is this. It might cost more to do employment than sheltered workshop for a couple years. It might cost more, sometimes it doesn't. But we need to evaluate whether this is worth doing by decades, not fiscal years. And I'll use my son as an example. Aaron has lots of issues, <laughs> as they say. And he was in and out of jobs for about 10 years with job coaches, very troubling. It went on for a long time, get a job, do well in a job, not show up, lose it, job coach back in again, lots of intention. And it was, you know, bucking up against the self-sheltered workshop fee, which he walked out of when he was 21 um, and just said, I'm not going to the sheltered workshop. Figure it out. Um, so for 10 years, this went on and on and on, and I was getting nervous and discouraged, and something clicked when he was about 38. Clicked. And he's been, now he's got his five-star pin with a giant grocery store, and he gets a raise every year, and he got a bonus payment, and he is so happy. And he doesn't go to a shelter workshop, and he needs almost no job coaching. 
So the 10 years will get them, what, 25 years of not needing anything during the day? That's how we have to think about this. So all these wonderful things about a job. And you know, I mean, I, the, the, what our jobs, you know, do they make a difference or not? When you meet somebody who only works four hours a week in a job, and you say, hello, how are you, what do you do? They will, the person will identify themselves as an employee of that job, even though they might only work four hours a week because there's so much pride and value and dignity that comes with that, which has an impact on health and mental health, et cetera, and behavior. Okay, what else are states doing? Um, you can go to this website, support. it supports twofamily.org. Um, NASDES has a five-year grant from the Administration on Intellectual Developmental Disabilities with the University of Missouri to work with five states, although you'll see six there because Missouri is a mentor state, um, to figure out how to change a system. Go back, think Britain. Think those big scale documents. How to change a state to really support families, not provide family support. For 50 years, we've been providing in most states a thing called family support. It's a cheap buyout. It's usually two, three, four, maybe $5,000 a year. You can go to camp. It's a cash payment. It's like, hold on, we'll get to you. Here's some family support money. This is reframing that. This is a system that supports families. Um, these are the states that are in. The goal is individual first, families next. Right? So the goal of the whole thing is, uh, the goal of the old family support systems that we ran, programs that we ran, was family, respite for the family. It didn't matter where the person went. It didn't matter if respite ended up being watching TV for a whole weekend. We didn't look at that, but the family got respite. They were, they were the target of the service. The target of supporting families is that the individual will have a good life and the family will have a good life, and we'll help the family support that individual in having a good life. Again, why? Not because we think everybody should live with their family or a relationship-based arrangement, but that's the only way we're going to have a sustainable system. So these, these states are, this is their template, their thinking life course. What is that? It's recognizing, let's admit it, people come in almost when they're born, and they stay until they die. And that is a trajectory. Things happen. A million different transitions happen at points in life. Things are changing all the time. We're a system that's used to treating people with a group home, job done. Place them in a shelter workshop, job done. We got them a job. What, they don't like that job? That's life. That's real life. They're talking about three different domains of supporting families. Let me go to the one. Let me see, I can't remember what slides I have in here. Okay, this I have to work with this slide. Um, the slide on the right is what we do every day, goods and services, respite care, physical adaptations, personal care attendant, um, that kind of you can bill it by the unit service. We know how to do that. The other two, we don't. The middle one is connecting and networking. And all the research shows, even in healthcare, that relationships with peers and mutual support takes people pretty far. And they don't come knocking on the door for service. You'd think that's something we might invest in. But instead, we hope that the ARC will do it. We hope some beneficiaries, we hope somebody will do that. Self-advocacy will figure it out. Parent to parent will figure it out. Instead of saying, mm, you know, it might be nice, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, we could get a really good network going here, families helping families, consumers helping consumers, and keep the infrastructure supported. People might volunteer in it, but keep that network afloat so that families have a place to go. Discovery and navigation. This is the front door. When families first come, they don't always want services. They just want help. Sometimes, where do I find a good dentist is a big one. And so what we do in our systems, I'm speaking, generalizing about 51 states, which is unfair, but generally what we do is we don't talk to families unless we have a slot open. 
right? They go on this waiting list or interest list. And then when we have a slot, because we don't want to talk to them if we don't have a slot open, because we'll create false expectations that we have services. Instead of being honest and saying, gee, I don't know if I can enroll you in any services, but I'm going to stay connected to you and help you try to figure some things out from the system and get connected to a family network and blah, 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 blah. And so the, all that stuff that England and the Netherlands and Germany are talking about, networks of support, community-based, we just go la, 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 la. All we know is Medicaid. And so what these five states are struggling with is how to turn their systems into something different. So what are they doing? Connecticut has, they're only in their second year of a five-year project. So the first year was, and it's a community of practice like our State Employment Leadership Network. So we're all learning from each other and they have community practices in their states. So Connecticut has two full-time people now in the central office to focus on nothing but systems change to support families. Um, and one of the energies they put themselves into, a number of these states have, is changing eligibility process. Because it's a horrible experience for people. And making it be... Not so horrible. Um, they've got a cross-agency department um, uh, lifespan team, um, and they are actively creating a sibling network. They brought the National Association of Sibling Network into Connecticut to help them build a sibling network, both of little ones and adults. By the way, um, are there any siblings in the room? Look, look, yes. Um, so I'm noticing a lot of the leadership in our field is coming out of siblings. You know those DOJ people that are around suing everybody? Two of them are siblings. <laughs> the one with the real teeth is a tiger sibling. Um, and I love her. <laughs> She's really great. Um, move out of the way. They got fire in their belly without guilt like families. Um, and so I think nurturing them as leaders in the field, um, uh, not just caregivers, um, is, is for our future. The District of Columbia is pr probably, um, if there was ever a question, can you turn a system around, the District of Columbia answers that question, and it is yes. This place was a cesspool for 30 years. This is a bad place. Um, they closed the institution, and people were no better off in the community. I mean, they found dead bodies in group homes that had been there for six months, and it was really bad. If you read, if you read the Washington um, Post, it was really, really awful stuff. Ten years ago, there was a big change, change in, in um, mayor, change in the team at the top, created a disability department, and it's really astounding to see um, how incredibly different that system is. A lot of providers put out of business, a lot of other providers recruited in, um, really amazing. But they are creating a new waiver that's focused on supporting families because they really have no family support system in DC at all. Um, there's a policy to add families and self-advocates to policy teams and pay st stipends, and they're putting it in legislation. Legislation to create a family advisory council across all DC programs in statute with grants. Um, they're changing their regulations to allow families to be paid uh, caregivers, and they are actively creating a parent-to-parent -parent network. So they're really looking at their infrastructure. By the way, going back to shared living, um, the guidance from DOL, I think, makes pretty clear that you can pay families that way. So that a family, mom and dad, can be contracted with to be a shared living arrangement in the same way a foster care family can. Now you may want to do that, and you may not want to do that. Might be compelling reasons to do it or not. But again, it's a, it's it's opening up the options. Tennessee is redesigning again point of contact and creating a parent to parent network. Redesigning Washington, redesigning first point of contract. Um, Oklahoma's got a blue ribbon panel on the waiting list. They're building the three domains in their blue ribbon panel. And Missouri, who's much further along, has um, in every one of their regions, 12 regions, a family support expert who um, works with their counties, um, et cetera. So th just some thoughts about what they're doing. Okay, part two. Okay, but we have to do a lot of things at once. We can't just do one thing at once. So it's not, it's not you know, overwhelming enough that we've got this demographic, demographic climate change. We have to think about changing our systems um, to be more family-friendly and get out of you know, heavy-duty facility-based services. 
but we've got um, new regulations. So we gotta focus on the lifespan and build a sustainable system, and we have to implement the new CMS regulations, which I think are the biggest thing in home and community services since the waiver was created. The waiver got us out of the institution. These regs expect people to really be in the community. Now, um, I just, I'm not gonna go through the regs. I'm gonna talk about coming into compliance with the regs. Um, you, you all know the regs. Some of you had Robin Cooper out on our staff. Whoever was brilliant enough to YouTuber, it was great. We're using the YouTube. Thank you for doing that. She's got a great slide presentation um, that walks you through item by item by item what these regs mean. I'm gonna talk about compliance. CMS is termed coming into compliance doing a transition plan. Um, the states will have to provide a plan that details any actions necessary to achieve and document compliance with the settings rule. What states have to do and how quickly depends on the timing of the new waiver. So, you know, states that have a waiver that's renewed now, you gotta do your transition plan now. States that don't have to do it for a while won't have to do it for a while. Um, okay, so it's no secret that NASDAQ is not happy with CMS right now over their guidance. Um, the, there's very little guidance. There's very little guidance. And what is out suggests that you might go out and inspect every site and determine whether it's in compliance with a rule that is very aspirational. Right? This is a rule. It's not about size. This is a rule that says you comply if they're, you're not interfering with people's autonomy, if they have equal access to the community as anybody else not getting home and key-based services. These are really squishy standards. Hard, if, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna relocate a person, as they say, or terminate a provider, you need some standard. These are appealable decisions in Medicaid. And so we're very frustrated. Um, and so we went back to our foundation, what we fall back on all the time, and this is the framework for systems change that we use for the State Employment Leadership Network. If you're gonna change a system, you need catalysts, you need vision, passion, leadership, the involvement of consumers and families, you need all that energy and excitement and vision and clarity, but you gotta do something with it. What does it mean to change the system? It means changing the infrastructure, as you well know. It means changing your rules, changing your definitions, changing your reimbursement system, changing what you measure, because what gets measured gets done, what gets paid for gets done. And so we're unhappy that CMS has not focused on infrastructure. So we are. And we put some guidance out to the states that we're sticking to um, because we think it's the only thing viable. I don't know, how many sites do you have? How many physical locations do you have in Pennsylvania or in Ohio that you'd have to inspect, do you think? Test for the D DOD. Uh, California has 28,000. <laughs> just in DD, just in DD. Um, so we know evaluating sites is probably an inefficient and ineffective thing to do. And it changes nothing. Because the day after you evaluate those sites, everything could change, right? And by the way, you know the standards. The evaluation of the site is people have, um, people are involved in their person-centered plan, people have uh, autonomy. It's all this, the experience of the person. You can't evaluate a site by going in. The standard describes what the experience is of people. So what we're suggesting is states need to in assess their infrastructure and change their infrastructure, otherwise known as the waiver application, which requires states to describe their infrastructure. And then over the course of their program lifespan, evaluate providers as the cycle comes up. You have support coordinators that monitor services, you have inspection that inspects sites, and you, if you have standards that comply with the federal standards, then you can be fairly assured that going forward you'll catch anybody who doesn't. So we're saying states ought to assess service definitions, service standards, 
right? Provider qualifications, training requirements, service contracts, maybe rate methodologies and billing. I, for one, at the far end, think that we're not paying for the bed in the group home anymore. We're paying for what that person does every day. So if there's no evidence of community inclusion, community interaction, maybe it's not a billable day, for instance. Right? Think about, um, well, I'll tell you that later. Um, the person-centered planning requirements, here's a great way to get at the regs. What are we building into our person-centered plans? Because a lot of the expectations in the regs are really part of the planning process. And then quality oversight. If we're measuring the old stuff and not measuring against the new standards, we're just reinforcing noncompliance. Um, and then our IT systems. What, will our IT systems tell us that people are in or not in compliance? Um, so assess waiver and state plan service definitions. These are just the standard statutory definitions. They're actually almost 300 service definitions because states make up everything else. Um, and they don't just use these. But here's the definition. The setting is integrated in and supports full. So think about this. Think about terminate a provider over this. The, se the setting is integrated in and supports full access of individuals to the greater community, including opportunities to seek employment and work in competitive employment, engage in community life, control personal resources, receive services in the community to the same degree and access that people who don't get services do. Optimizes but does not regiment individual initiative and autonomy. I believe in this and this is the right standard. Translating this into something enforceable is the challenge that states have. Um, just, this is just really breaking down those components. So standards and service requirements, it's regulations and standards, it's provider qualifications and training requirements. Again, figuring out how to build in that language. And I think, we think, that you need, there's some factors to consider when you're working on your service definitions and standards in collaboration with your stakeholders, we advise, and that is, is there a setting or type or size in which integration is likely to occur? CMS did put out a couple, like the farms aren't probably gonna make it, right? The collective farms probably aren't gonna make it. But beyond that, what? Is there a size? I personally believe there is a size. I'd argue that there's a size. I mean, the little bit of research we have says, you know, under six better things happen. People are more likely to have, I'm not crazy about six, by the way. I lived in a six-bed group home for four years. It's too many people. But I'd go down lower than that. But we know there, that's, and mental health has much more research on size making a difference. Um, uh, settings uh, provide multiple types of services and activities on site in a manner that creates barriers. So are there things that are going on that create the barriers? Is there regimentation in daily activities? Um, or, I mean, one way to get at this is we'll fund anything that looks like anything else in the community, like anybody else's home, the average citizen's home. Um, by the way, I don't think this reg is just about facilities. That person-centered section of the reg is everybody. It's, you can't be funding people's services in their own homes and they sit and watch TV all day. Same standard applies. Inclusion, active in your community. Um, is there a setting where, where um, integration is less likely to occur? CMS gave us a hint, the farms. Um, but would you never allow people to live on a farm and do home incubation services? I don't think you'd never allow that. So coming up with how you characterize this is going to be challenging. Um, what type of activity uh, in the community meets the standard and how much activity? I mean, here's the question people are raising. I have a highly segregated, isolated day program, but Harry only goes there four hours a week. Harry's life's pretty integrated. The setting isn't. Hmm. Um, the aging people are bringing this up a lot. Um, where is my other slide that says... Uh, uh, maybe not be here, but I think um, the other thing we need to take into account is what goes on in the setting. For instance, if you're serving people with Prater Willie, you're probably locking the food up, right? If you're um, serving people who are criminal offenders, you're probably imposing restrictions, if you're, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we need to think about what's happening in the facility, if it's a facility, and how that has to be factored into standards. 
What do people do at the end of the day? Okay, so we don't have very good guidance from CMS about settings rule for, an, I guess you call it residential. We have nothing on day. And they're not interacting with people much to develop this. And so we feel like we have to fill the void. Um, and so this got us thinking about day. What's, and this is from, um, most of this comes from, um, oh, I'll think of her name in a minute. She does big work in um, non-work day services. And I'll think of it in a minute. And I should have her footnote here. Um, but this is what happens in our day. Work, volunteer, learning activities, community organizations, recreation, social life, taking care of our house, caring for other people was a big part of it. By the way, great job opportunities in the future, right? Long-term care. Um, hobbies, going on, I mean, all of this is part of everyday life. What are we talking about? Day activities. As though nine to three is something magical, right? It is, if you, if you go to work, there's like an off and on. But the rest of our life isn't like that. And, and it got me thinking, going back to service definitions and rate setting. Some of the most creative stuff I've seen, this is like, um, I'm very, uh, this is blasphemy, I'm going to speak now. Um, but some of the more creative arrangements I've seen where people's life is just a flow and it's a natural life like mine and it's not a click on, click off, go to the day program, go to the day provider, are these agencies um, who, ha who don't operate facilities, who do everything in like supported living or shared living or something, but who have the whole bundled rate. And that agency's job is to help that person get a good life. And if they need a job coach and that agency doesn't know how to do job coaching, they might buy a job coach agency. But they don't send their person off to another agency. I think this reg invites us to think about how we do this. How, what's the mechanism that enables the caregiving agency to make a real life for somebody. And I'm not ready to say we should bundle rates to everybody. I don't mean to say that's the blasphemy. But I do think the way we contract and pay may be an impediment to people having a life flow, an integrated life. Anyway, something to think about. Um, how do people engage in community life? Oh, and then there's all the un unplanned interaction. And this is where I think the definition of community can benefit from this kind of thinking. Where people live, or are during the day, should have opportunities for unplanned interaction. That's the real richness of life. It's that I ran into somebody while I was walking my dog. I ran into Harry at the store. Then I'm in a big and my Aaron helping the lady next door take her groceries in. And the, the Halloweeners come to the door. And he talks to the, the postman. And, you know, if you live in a place where you're never going to see the postman come to the door or the Halloweeners won't come, you're probably not meeting the definition. Um, oh, here's factors to consider. Um, if activities are conducted in groups, is there a, is there a, a size that's a wrong size? Um, what's the frequency of activity that meets the standard? Should standards differ by age of individuals? I hope nobody does a group home for children. I would say for children, you don't meet the standard. Children must be with their family or next of kin like they do in child care or somebody close. Um, working age adults and the elderly. Nashua and we argued strong with CMS that they should define the rule by over 64 and under 64. Because what's mucking this whole thing up is there's so much assisted living in the Medicaid waiver now they can't get it out. And so all of this mushiness is to not say can't have anything big. So they, that's, where, that's how they got to this individual room and locked door and controlling. They, they decided to define what happens for a person in assisted living and their room because the, it, the, what's that expression, horses out of the barn? And so we're all sort of stuck with this now. But I do think, I, don't, I won't be in an assisted living facility, I don't think. I won't be in an over 65 community. But lots of people in our culture are. 
and going back to old Wolf Wolfensburger days from those of you who remember him, and um, this you know, culturally normative concept, what's normal? What's normal is what most people do is what's normal. And in our society, a lot of people at a certain age go live together. So if they have disabilities, okay, let's allow that. If they're old, let, let's let assisted living happen in the waiver over 65, but not under 65. Anyway, anyway, the reg doesn't address this at all. If I were a state, I'd be looking to compartmentalize my definitions, maybe by age. Should standards reflect the purpose of the facility? Sometimes there is a purpose, as in treating people with severe Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, okay. Assess service contracts, you know, um, oh, I'm getting close to time. Um, the billable activity, should our invoices now describe what the person was doing, like in Washington State, where the employment providers have to have on the invoice the hours and wages of the person they supported, so there's evidence. Should billing, should, if not billing, should utilization review and auditing look at the documentation to support this activity, and then the question is, how do we get documentation that isn't burdensome? I think these, where these regs are all at is the person-centered planning stuff. It's full of requirements on person-centered planning um, that requires states now to show evidence. So get ready. I mean, states are going to have to have, they're going to have to prove to CMS through documentation that all this stuff happens, including the signatures. But I think this is the unsung strength of these regs, the person-centered planning requirements. And so it's all these things. Does it reflect what's important to the person? This puts, you're the counties. You all do the support coordination, right? And all the planning, right? Counties are all in charge of that. So this is your baby. This is how you control everything. You control the first conversation. You, do, you help, you structure that discussion to define what happens. And I know you've got some, you've got a, a neat thing going on here. Imagine with about 15 or 16 counties, right? Which is, I've seen the, the stuff on YouTube, and I talk to Mary Lou Bourne all the time, and that positions you beautifully for these regs. It's great. Um, conflict of interest. Ugh. This is like the Ohio part of the regs. Um, <laughs> the truth is there are only 11 states by our account, by the NASDAQ's unscientific research. There are only 11 states that are truly conflict-free. Um, and um, and it's really important, and CMS knows it's important, and they've been pushing this for a long time. Um, they're the BIP rules, uh, money follows the person, and it's just simply the people who could make money on you shouldn't be the ones who plan what you get. I mean, it's just really a no-brainer. Um, you've had a framework that's been working for you for a long, working for you, and, there's, and you've been changing. I mean, you've been um, winding out of these arrangements in many parts of Ohio. Um, you're on the right path. You probably need a thoughtfully, a thought, thought out replacement for your framework to create some targets and mechanisms. Um, and I don't know what the complications are, um, but I do think the strength of the Ohio system as it used to be in Pennsylvania was the county-based system. I mean, I think that idea of local responsibility, this is what Europe's talking about, <laughs> going back to local networks, that local responsibility and that where your power and, and where it is you have an impact is in how you support families and how you design services in those individual plans. That's why I say the person center planning is the crux of these regs. Um, and so I, I don't think uh, CMS is going to be marching in here tomorrow, but inevitably they will, and they'll challenge. I think you have time to work on it to get to a reasonable um, balance. Um, and I don't know what else to say about this. Every state's facing this. Um, the difference is you're doing it in partnership. Where is the conflict? This is, you know, you're, you're welcome to have these slides. Um, 
where there is a conflict, the state must devise conflict of interest protections. There, you know, Wyoming, um, be careful pulling the rural card, by the way. Um, Wyoming can pull the rural card. Montana can pull the rural card. That, you know, there's nobody here but this one, you know, uh, agency. Um, and, you know, Pennsylvania can't pull the rural card, even though Pennsylvania has the largest rural population in the United States. They have the most people that live in areas defined rural, but you know, it's not much of a rural state anymore. <laughs> um, population's pretty big. Um, but nevertheless, CMS recognized that uh, problem. Uh, assess plan documentation. There's big stuff in here about the plan, so the counties and the state, um, you need to work on making sure that individual persons that a plan is is doable, reasonable, friendly, um, and that the back room backup documentation is easy to do, easy to access, and doesn't get where, um, I think New York State, because of program integrity oversight, ended up doing 15 minute billable units in residential programs. Documenting 15 minute billable units in residential programs. You don't wanna go there. Assess plan documentation requirements. Um, I, I'm not going to go through this laboriously. You can read the regs and you know. Quality management, bottom line here is what gets measured gets done. And so however the state's monitoring, and you are monitoring the individual plans, your UR practices, the definition of community has to get built in now. How much are people going out? Do they see their family and friends? And by the way, this is where National Core Indicators, we've just done a crosswalk with National Core Indicators and the new regs, nice match, a really nice match. Um, and we have in this state um, uh, uh, some individual county participation in NCI in addition to the whole state. And information systems, and I know that in Ohio, you're working on that as well, because if the information technology system doesn't support all your new processes, you keep doing it the old way, right? So this is what we say to states. That's your transition plan. Tell CMS you're gonna evaluate all that stuff, what the time frame is, you're gonna evaluate all that stuff, and when all that stuff is done, you'll go out and you'll forever, from going forward, evaluate services against those standards. Don't you think that makes sense? I think it makes sense. Okay, so the rules, um, it's a lot to do and a lot to think about, but I gotta say, an incredible opportunity to get home and community-based services where they really ought to be. This is a real opportunity. And that is the end.